Uh, it's very profitable, profitable, brethren, for the way we're participating with each other this morning. There's going to be opportunity for ministry after lunch. If you have something in your heart, um, be ready. It'll be in a semi-open ministry type format. So hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to us and take us on down that road. If you turn with me to um, Romans chapter 15 and we read in the scriptures here from verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? The God of hope fill you with all joy. Brethren, be happy that you're saved. Be happy. Don't mope the fact that you got born again. Now you're in the problem of having to give your life. Because that's what's going to have to happen. You're going to have to give your life. You got saved, give your life. Secondly, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So now to abound in something means that you experiencing plenty of it. And what are you to abound in? Abound in hope. And what is the greatest hope that we're about we're to abound in? The hope of the resurrection. But remember, the hope of the re resurrection brings with it judgment day. So, you know, you're not going to be wanting to be judged if you're not fulfilling the call of God on your life. It means you'll be without joy and you'll be without hope. So, make sure, stir the gift. Because he says here now in verse 14, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye, are, ye also are full of goodness. Now, I don't know if somebody can give us a meaning of what goodness is. Good fruit? Well, the works that we've been Call to. You are full of goodness when you are fulfilling your call. Because then you're fulfilling that which God has designed for you to be. He goes on and he said, says, filled with all knowledge. So that was Nico's point just now, wasn't it? Filled with all knowledge. Of course, you're not able to apply yourself in goodness if you don't have any knowledge. And then the third one is able also to admonish one another. I found that, found that quite an interesting little angle in the scriptures. You're, when are you able to admonish me? What does it mean to admonish? No. To correct me. To admonish means you can correct me. But you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm saying to you, brethren, that we need to agree with one another this morning that we are willing to be corrected of one another. Are you willing to be corrected? Willing to receive godly direction and godly input into your life. And that we will be, and, and I, I'm going I'm to put it like this, in view of the fact that this is what we're going to be judged for, <clears throat> 
we need to ensure that every one of us is actively involved in our gift. You've got to make sure I am, and I've got to make sure you are. And the reason why you need to be involved in your gift is because you're going to be judged. And I've got to have the liberty to admonish you if you're not. And you've got to have the liberty to admonish me if I'm not. You, and you're not going to admonish me to punish me. But what are you going to do? You're going to admonish me to encourage me. Your admonition, what is all admonishing supposed to achieve? Encouragement and hope. Provoking one another to good works. Bringing each other into the outworking. And folks, I think sometimes we leave it a little bit too loosely. But let's get involved in one another's lives. Let's say, hey, psst, what's going on? I'm admonishing you. I, but I'm, I love you. And you know I love you. Because you see, and you love me. And I receive your admonishment because I see that you've laid your life down for me. I've earned the right to admonish you. You've, you've laid your life down and you're seeing to it that I'm going to have a happy judgment day. I'm a little bit concerned, brethren, that some of us are not going to be having a happy judgment day. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm worried about it. Not everyone is going to have a happy judgment day. There's another king whom you need to deal with sharply. You remember when um, uh, Saul was required to kill Oh, and what did he bring back? He brought back one king. He just brought back the king. And Samuel says to him, hey, so, what's that I hear? He said, oh no, the people told me that I should just bring back the best. So I brought back, and, and who's that? And now that's just the king. And, and, and you know what Samuel says? You king, come here. And he takes his sword and he cuts it into slivers. Stew king. Doesn't he send that throughout Israel? Is that not the occasion? It's a different occasion. Eh? But he makes of him stew cubes. This way and this. Hews him in pieces. Puts him to death. He dealt ruthlessly with the king. And that's what has to happen in our lives. And I'm, I'm making this suggestion. That brethren, we knit together. We say to one another that, listen, I'm struggling to fulfill my ministry. Please pray with me. Please help me. Please direct me. Please give me guidance. We've been here fellowshipping together for more than 10 years now. And some are still in exactly the same place that you were 10 years ago. There's been no movement. That's not a wise place to be. I'm really suggesting this morning that you stir up the gift that is with you. I, I, I'm, I'm aware of this, 
that if you're going to admonish one another, you have to have the knowledge. And if you're going to admonish one another having knowledge, you'll be admonishing in these directions and you will understand what work these do. Now, I don't know if you... I think that's also part of the problem amongst us. We don't understand what the function is of these various giftings. Now, I, I think if we could ask Alex to give us a, a one-minute exposition on each of those so that we can be clear of what that direction is. What does that one do? So what, which one would you like to start with? Okay. One word, he's a builder. He's a foundation layer. He takes the scriptures and he establishes them in the heart of the man. Make sure they know the truth. And the truth then makes them Um, to, to exercise the gift. Motivate. Brethren, there's no point in you motivating me to draw closer to God if that's not going to end in me fulfilling my gift. Because that's what I'm going to be judged for. I'm not going to be judged for how close I am to God. If coming close to God doesn't result in the application of the gift, and by the way, your gift doesn't have to be applied from behind the pulpit. Isn't that good news? But it can be functional within the fellowship and where you work. But if it's not functioning in the fellowship, I can tell you now it's not functioning at work. Because it starts in the fellowship. You are a member of the body, isn't it? So now, the body comes together and the members of the body function. And of course, when you go to work, it's not that you get cut off, but you're over there and you're not over here. And you function there. If you function here, you function there. You can't function there and not here. The third one, soul winner, Christian. I, I hear what everybody says about the world is hard, it's hard to see people get saved, but I'm absolutely persuaded that if you have the gift of winning souls, you will win souls. You might not have the gift to do that, and that's why you don't win souls. That's what I find. But people who have that specific gifting win souls. They often lose them again because they don't know how to establish them. So, do you, do you know what happened to Philip? Um, he was with the Ethiopian eunuch. And he had just finished with him and he got out of the chariot. And the Holy Ghost came along and said, Now, well, now you've got to get out from here. And he took him to, I think, Azotus. Was, is that not somewhere near Samaria? But he ended in Samaria, and he preached in Samaria. After three months, a whole lot of souls got saved. And guess what happened? Did he stay there? No, he moved on. But the apostles came there and established those believers on the truth. So each one of these is not an empire-building exercise. Isn't that wonderful? We're not into building empires. We're not into organizationalism. We're into serving God. No. All of them must function in every life to get the correct end result. Very important. And then we'll go to? Oh. 
nurturer. A nurturer. Okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna nurture, if you're gonna lay a foundation or be a builder, if you're gonna be a what did you say? Motivator, if you're gonna be a soul winner, if you're gonna be a nurturer, at the core of it, at the very heart of it, you have to have a working understanding of the principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say to you, brethren, this, this morning, if you're not proficient in the principles of the doctrine of Christ, you will never fulfill your gift. Ever. You will attempt and you will be able to do bits and pieces here and there scantily. But this gift has got principles by which they operate. And the principle is Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about the principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we're talking about Jesus Himself. He is the principle. So, I'm not talking about being able to preach them from a pulpit. I'm talking about being able to communicate them to people in whatever format you're going to communicate them. If it's a one-on-one, -on -one, great. If it's two people, um, and, uh, um, and I want to ask you to make an appointment with yourself and with the Lord and say, this year I'm going to lead a soul to Christ or find one that has been led to Christ and I'm going to have input into their lives according to the gift that I have. The whole to practice on. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to one. You are able to, what did he say? He says, I'm persuaded of you that you are able to admonish one another. I'm persuaded of you. There's another verse in 1 Corinthians 15 that I want to just drop into your heart. One Corinthians chapter fifteen. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And now listen to this. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be Ye steadfast. Describe steadfast. Doesn't <laughs> do. If you don't do, not because you're dead or or stubborn. Stubbornly, the only way eventually you can get a donkey to move is to bite his tail. Step unmovable. Now, don't. You know, there's unmovable and there's unmovable. There's negative unmovable and there's positive unmovable. Negative unmovable is, oh, you're not going to tell me what to do. Positive unmovable is, you're not swayed from the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You don't have your own interpretation of the scripture. Always abounding. In the work of the Lord. For as much as in the Lord. 
So we get on with the job, always abounding more and more, reaching people. Corinthians chapter 16, same book 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and in verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Acacia, that's Greece, eh? and that they have, listen to this wording, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So what do they do? What do you think they were doing, practically? They were constantly involved in these five gifts in the lives of men and women. But you can't do it without it. Being able to list the seven principles of the doctrine of Christ doesn't mean you've understood a single thing about them. Being able to list them backwards doesn't mean you know anything about them. Being able to jumble them up, and usually jumbling them up comes from not knowing what they are. And brethren, if we're not proficient in the principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the gift cannot function. We will be hamstrung. The gift will want to work. The gift is there to work. And it's not a head knowledge. It, it starts with the head because you've got to understand what it is. But then it comes into your heart and it, it energizes and propels the gift you've got. Is that correct? That's what happens. So how do you get a working, functioning application knowledge of the principle? You start... There's a, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, whatsoever my hands have found to do for the Lord, that I have done with all of my I've given my life. Having these exercised by recent reason of use. Um, Matthew 19. Somebody must get ready to come and share with us in the front here. If you're ready, then you pop up now, now. Matthew 19.24. Let's go to 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, and this is an encouragement for us, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard this, um or heard it, they were exceeding amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So, brethren, with God all things are possible. He is able to inspire us, able to lead us, able to direct us, able to help us, he is more than able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. Uh, Abel is saying, he is able, but am I willing? So it doesn't mean he will present us faultless. It says he is 
able to present a fault. Depending on our willingness. To Timothy, chapter 4. Just to draw our attention to this fact that Paul says in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And he says, For I have fought the good fight. I, I get this picture that Paul didn't have an easy life. Do you get that picture? Why do you get that picture? Because it was a fight. And I'm going to tell you, brethren, it's a fight to do the will of God. It's a fight. It's a fight against the flesh. It's a fight against principalities and powers. Although that fight is one that has been won already. And all we need to do is to stand. And in having stood, we've put on the armor of and we've won the battle. But the fight is the fight against the flesh. I've fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The brilliant scripture there. Able to admonish one another. I'm going to suggest that we, cut, that we regularly uh, impose upon one another to say, my brother, how is your ministry going? Impose on me. Pro what does it say in the scriptures in the book of Hebrews? It says, neglect not the gathering of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another daily. As we see the phrase, so much the more as we see the day approaching. I think we should be involved in one another's lives daily. Not as busybodies, but as those who are encouraging each other and inspiring one another to be fruitful in the Lord. I'm reminded of the, uh, the owner of the vineyard who's got a tree growing in the middle of the vineyard. And he gets to the gardener and he says to the gardener, cut it down. It does, it's not bearing fruit. And the owner of the vineyard, or rather the gardener in the vineyard says, Master, let it alone this one year. You know who the gardener is? He's precious. He's wonderful. And if your tree hasn't been bearing fruit, then the gardener is saying today, let it alone this one year. And let me dig it about. Now, brethren, the only way it can be dug about is if we get active in one another's life. The Lord Jesus doesn't come and dig around in my life personally. This is the person of Jesus Christ. Are you getting that? This is the person of Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. And this person needs to be active to dig it about. Now, if the gardener is lazy, how can it ever be digged about? So, uh, and of course, if you've got a king in your life, you'll be too busy with your king. You're his servant, remember? You're his subject. And he will demand his pound of flesh from you. So there's a tremendous, uh, Paul writes it like this, forgetting those things which are behind. 
I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Who's got something to say? Come to uh, Sorry, can you come after Sean? Uh, how do you attract that comment every time? You know, we can see that. <laughs> yeah, you must have this thing. I don't have any... Um, I want to share with you just something, something the Lord showed me. And it's in the book of um, Minor Prophets, which we call Minor Prophets, but they're very major. Um, Zechariah. Um, just, just to give us an idea, I just saw this beautiful picture of how God um, just describes this for us. and gives us a picture of what's going on. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, just in case we think that we, we're not worthy um, and we think we have to first get a degree of thoughts before we can do God's will. Um, in actual fact, all we have to do is just be connected to Jesus through the foundation. He is the foundation. Um, this is what Rupert's been talking about, the, the um, first principles of the doctrines of Christ. They are the communication of the foundation, if you like. So that as we communicate with one another the, um, these principles of Jesus, so we um, are actually laying the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Um, he's the foundation. Um, and we, by the principles, we communicate him into each other's hearts. So if these ministries, these five gift ministries that God has given, which are, by the way, part of the foundation of the church, um, because it is Jesus. So um, they each one represent the Lord Jesus. Each one is an ambassador for Christ. So being ambassadors for Christ, they're going to be doing what he wants them to do, and that is communicating the foundation. Um, but we always think that we have to be super spiritual because, I don't know, even the Christian world gives that impression that preachers of the word must be, they must have it together. They must have a church of 150 or whatever it is, a big building, um, everything, they've just got it together. Um, folks, it's not like that. Um, God has called us to communicate these principles no matter what, no matter where we find ourselves and who we were. And just in Zechariah, he just says this now, because it's, it's beautiful, really. In chapter 4, it says, and he has another one where we have a prophet who's having an experience with Almighty God, and God is speaking to him, and he's taking the Word of God and speaking it to us, and it's beautiful. Um, and may the Holy Ghost take word today and just bring it to us. He says, and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. May God awaken us today out of our sleep. In fact, I've got to say to you that if we've been smokled with the smoke of this world, we are sleeping and we need to wake up um, because God's work is going on. And, and you know what, Rupert? Each year we say the same thing. Lord, let us dig it about and work with it another year so that it may perhaps bear fruit. But time is running out. There may not be a year left. So we've got to get busy now um, fertilizing and doing God's work. But look what he says. So, Lord, awaken us out of our sleep, please. And he says, And said unto me, What seest thou? What do you see? What do you see, man of God? That's to you, brethren. What do you see of Jesus? What do you see of the vision of God? What do you see of the word of God? And this is what he says. He says, and I said, I've looked. Have you looked? Look and see what God has got for you. He says, I have looked and behold, a candlestick full of gold. What does that speak of? Candlestick full of gold. It speaks of Jesus, if you ask me. That's what it speaks of. And he says, um, you can go and look in Revelation chapter, which chapter is it? Where he speaks of the golden candlestick and the seven branches, chapter 1. And he says, and so he says, I saw this candlestick all of gold with a bowl on the top of it. I mean, that's strange. <laughs> You'd think the candlestick will be 
on top of the bowl, the bowl is on top of the candlestick. And then he says this, I'm going to read it and then say what I see. He says, and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top of it. So you have this candlestick with a bowl on top of it with the seven candlesticks or the seven lamps on top of that. And that's just speaking to me of this foundation of Jesus Christ. He's the candlestick. Um, and out of him is coming, coming seven golden pipes through which he's communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, these seven, I don't want you to get confused, we've got five pipes here. But these seven pipes are there to minister God's word to the churches because the lamps are the churches. And then in the book of Revelation, you have seven churches receiving messages from seven angels which are um, ministering to these seven churches. But they're ministering what Jesus Christ, the foundation, wants to say to the church. And folk, it's awesome, really, when you look at this foundation. And he says this, he says, um, but this is what I love about it. It's, it's, Seven lamps with seven pipes um, out of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel talked with me and answered and said unto me, Knowest now thou not what these be? Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of us. And so it's like the real, I suppose, Francois will be able to help us with it if he needs to, but it's about the seven pipes and the seven lamps is really the seven that are ministering to the churches, if we like. Spirits being ministering spirits, angels, speaking to the church God. But but folks, what I what I enjoyed about it was that this was a message that was to uh, Zechariah for Israel, speaking particularly about the two olive branches, because he goes on to talk about that now. But for us, God has given us five um, pipes to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with one another. And there they are. Five pipes. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, Rupert always says they are rusty old pipes. You know, Rupert, you look rusty. <laughs> but that pipe is not rusty. It's gold. I'm telling you. God's word coming through these pipes. And when these pipes are operating in the church of the Lord Jesus, they are very powerful. Um, and folk, and that takes the pressure of us. We don't have to be anything special to share God's word with one another. We just need to be right with God. And He, by His Spirit, through the power of the Holy Ghost, will take the word of God and minister it to the pipe that it will achieve a goal. And the goal being that every one of us will be edified and up in the most holy faith, by God's word. Um, very often, um, I'm, I don't see myself as a, as a pastor. And yet I find often that I'm almost in that role, if you like, in Montague Gardens. But um, I find that when I get to that point and there's a situation in front of me and I'm faced with decisions that have to be made and things that must be said, then I say, um, Father, I don't know how to do this. I really don't know how to do this. And um, folk, I'm amazed. And then the Lord just ministers to my heart. Sean, just get them under the sound of the word. That's it. Don't worry about doing anything else. Just bring them under the sound of the word. Isn't it amazing? Bring them the pipes. Bring them to the Lord that he may minister to their hearts. Now just to um, finish off, he says here, let's read on in verse 8. Uh, where was it? Oh, I like this. Um, but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts, in verse, verse 7, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Folks, there's not a mountain and there's not a king that can stand before the Lord. He will bring it down by the power of the Holy Ghost with his word, coming through these ministries. And this is what he says now. He says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have what? Laid the foundation of the house. 
his hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. How do you like those things? And then he says this, For who hath despised the day of small things? Folk, are you getting it? Small things. It's not the big things, it's the small things that achieve the goal. Who has despised the day of small things? It's a day of small things today. You and me, we're small things. He says, For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. So there's Zerubbabel working with the Lord to build and to lay the foundation of the temple of God. Is that not what we are doing, each one of us? He says, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Like What a picture of a ministry of Jesus Christ. Emptying the oil out of himself. Which gives us to being squeezed, if you like. And um, he says here, And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And I believe that's a reference to Moses and Elijah. In the, uh, when they minister God's word to Israel. Okay, and it's powerful. These are two golden pipes which God has prepared to minister the word of God to Israel that the remnant may be saved. So that this powerful plan of God can actually be put into action and they can come about the fulfillment of it. God has planned it and purposed it in his heart. And folk, has he not planned and purposed for you and me that we should fit into the slot that God has for us to fulfill the plan of God? to preach the word of God through the golden pipes that he has given us to minister Jesus Christ one to another. That's what he's called us for. In fact, you know what's glorious? It's his plan, his purpose. He's called you and me to fit in to the slot where that golden pipe goes in this foundation. But you know what? I'm so excited to be part of God's word to the church. It's exciting if there's two or three folk like I just want to do this one little thing in, in closing. You know, it's, it's so exciting to be involved in the, in the little things. Because, um, Kirk, stand up, please. I want to show you something. Come stand in the front, please. Just for a minute. Nearly finished. Don't worry. Peter, I'm nearly finished. <coughs> Kirk, quickly, quickly, if you can. <laughs> um, uh, look at this guy. Just stand there, face the audience, please. What do you think of that? Big and scary? Something else? I'm not. What did you say, Professor? Prime specimen. I thought it was like prime steak, but what did you say? Speak by prime. <laughs> but fuck, you know what? When I look at this man, and I've said it to him so many times before, I've said, you know what, Kurt? I thank God that he that he doesn't look for anything in us to fulfill the ministry. But fuck, I want to tell you something about this brother. His life is a mess. Let me be honest with you. He'll tell you that himself. He tells me, oh boy, him and Sarah come on, on Sunday. Was it Sunday? Wednesday night. Oh boy, the whole world's falling apart. It's all come down on them. But folk, on Thursday night, we go through. And the Lord puts it on my heart. He says, Sean, make him preach. And I'm like, Lord, are you sure you're right in this? <laughs> make him preach. Kurt must preach, not me, him. And folk, I tell you, Kurt, you can sit down. <coughs> so we, we went to um, Belleville South. We've got a, we had a meeting there with one, two, three, four, five colored people, five or six colored people and their families. And folks, let me tell you something. Sometimes that meet, meeting is full. And there was just six of us the other night or seven of us. But I'll tell you something. He shares with us the principle of baptism into Jesus Christ. Eight points. Simply, we got through four. Of course, it was Kurt. Um, and let me tell you something, folks. We were 85 out of our socks. We were touched with the power of God through the word of God coming through a pipe. Praise his name. It doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. It doesn't matter how well we feature out there in the world. It, doesn't, it actually matters if we've been beaten up the whole week. Praise his name. Because at the end of the day, the church of Jesus Christ is being built. In fact, I'll tell you, those folk love the word of God. The couple that owns the house calls us afterwards to come and pray for them because they want to be there available for us to minister to. That's their desire. And so we pray for them. But folk, I tell you what, God is working. 
So I want to encourage you. You know what I said then when, we were, when I went back from there? I said to myself, I said, Lord, you know what? If only I could get more brethren to just come and sit here and enjoy what we're enjoying. Because by sitting there, I'm being edified by the Lord Jesus. And I'm being built up in my side of God. It's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Amen. Further up. Right up there. No, no. Excellent. Um, I just want to share with you from um, 2 Thessalonians. And we're reading from uh, chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> funny enough, you know, I had this laid upon my heart last night when I was just reading and I thought to myself, well, it just didn't find a place really in even almost in my heart last night. And funny enough, when Rupert um, stood up a bit earlier, in fact, when he started, he said, if anyone will not work, um, he shall not eat. And I thought, well, my goodness, I mean, this whole Bible, I mean, this is just laid upon my heart. So I thought I'd just take the liberty of sharing. So I thought, well, that's got to be a confirmation. Um, and I'm reading from verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toiled day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. And, and I really wanted to apply this, not perhaps in the principle this is being applied, but certainly as I saw it, as far as ministry is concerned. And there's, there's two levels that I just wanted to share briefly with you. One was um, the level that we worked on, and the other one is really is the level that the Lord works on through us. And I, I suppose the thing that I had laid upon my heart is that, am I eating somebody else's bread without laboring? Am I just sitting in the meeting, listening to the labor of somebody else's ministry? And I come here and I feast sumptuously on what the Lord has to say. And I'm just sitting, listening. And that's all I'm doing. And the scripture says, you know, eating someone, nor did I eat anyone's bread free of charge. And I thought to myself, what an indictment. What an indictment if that is our ministry. Coming to church to listen to somebody else minister. It's a scary thought. But, you know, unfortunately it's happening. There are churches full of people listening to one-man ministries listening to what other people have labored, and they eat free of charge. And, I, and the scripture goes on, and it says that I might not be a burden, or it says we, but let's apply to ourselves, that I might not be a burden to any one of you. And I thought to myself, look at my own heart. Am I a burden to my brethren who are toiling, be it in ministry, be it in uh, going out and ministering, be it in evangelism, and we, we know what we've been called to do. And I thought to myself, where am I sitting in this? You know, am I feasting with my snout in the trough, so to speak, on ministry that somebody else is laboring night and day in, and I'm just arriving and I'm eating free of charge? And who of us like people who live free of charge? You know, I'm, I'm involved with security at the, at the marina, and there's a chap there that I went to speak to, and he won't pay 250 rand a month. And I said to this guy, you know, it's, it's eight rand a day. It's, it's a quarter of a cup of coffee. That's all it's costing you to have security guards and everything. And he says to me, it's my turn to freeload. That, that was his terminology. He said, I'm a freeloader. Can I get out of my house? And you know, folks, if I say this nicely to you, are any of us freeloaders here? I hope we're not freeloaders. But you know, there's a, there's a freeloading amongst ourselves when we are just listening to ministry without any input, without being involved in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that kind. But you know, there's another freeloading, and that is really freeloading off the Lord, isn't it? I mean, we're freeloading off Him. And I was just considering these, um, these positions, if I can use that term, that the Lord has placed um, at, for our disposal. And, you know, we can be freeloading off the Lord Jesus Christ because, you know, our whole um, involvement in ministry is actually for the Lord and for, for the people that we're out there. And I thought to myself, you know, Lord, let me not be let me not be one of those people that, that the Scripture speaks about over here, that I'm going to become a burden. And I, and I looked at myself and I said, am I a burden to my brethren? It's, it's a difficult thing, but am I a burden to my brethren? Are there other people carrying me? Are there other people ministering to me? Are there other people carrying the burden of my spiritual weakness? That they are perhaps even having to pray for me? 
or are they toiling over me and coming to visit me to try and encourage me? You know, folks, none of us. Do we want to see cabinet ministers freeloading? Do we want to see government people freeloading? You know how our spirits rise up when we see people who are actually in government and they say, but they're earning that salary, two and a half million rand a year or whatever it is, and they do nothing. Sorry? Yo, they play in Candy Crush in a, in a, in a sonar um, thing. And you know how our spirits rise up. But yet we're quite happy sometimes just to be part of the body of Christ and arrive and sit there and listen to some man's labor uh, that we haven't labored for. We're happy to eat for free somebody else's ministry that he's labored over and we just suck it in and take it in. Lovely ministry. Shake his hand and say, thanks, Bru. Really, that touched my heart. And we go home and we watch TV. Next week we're back again. Thank you, Bru, for a lovely ministry. Hey, I really enjoyed that. Goodbye, I'm on my way again. Folks, we don't want to be like that. And you know, we can actually be like that one to another, but you know, we also don't want to find ourselves being a freeloader on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you consider what he did for us, I mean, he didn't minister to us, he died for us. I mean, that, that, that's, that's serious stuff. Though. That's serious stuff, yeah. And, and just really in, in closing, and you know what the scripture says, if anyone will not work, he shall not eat. And that, I suppose, is the hard wrath of God, that if you don't work, you don't eat. And thank goodness that's been tempered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank goodness that was tempered by him, that he went and he died for us, that we might find grace through him. Because I'll tell you, if we were working with a, a wrathful God, folks, we would die of hunger. If you don't work, he says you don't eat. And you know, we as a church don't want to have that heart. But you know, just as encouragement, you know, folks, brethren, let me say, not folks, brethren, let me say this to you. Don't find yourself being a freeloader or, a, or a, as the scripture speaks about, eating um, anyone or someone's bread. In other words, eating somebody else's food that he's actually prepared and you've just gone and eaten and you've just taken it and enjoyed it and walked out. You know, may, may we be encouraged in our heart that we've got to add value, if I may say, spiritual value, not only into the lives of one another, but into the lives of those people that, that the Lord has called us to save. Yeah. Amen. that the Lord's dealing with me, I don't know, but I guess um, quite relevant. I think uh, being a parent, we often underestimate our children's ability. And I don't know if you've ever been in a scenario where you go somewhere and the child just doesn't do much. And you've got to deal and contend with the scenario. But um, just something that I, I looked into was how do you deal with a kid like this? Obviously, God gives us wisdom, but something that I read up on was he... Is that okay? All right. I think so. Something that I read up on was the fact that if you set your expectation for a child here, they're always going to persist to get their way on a certain level. But if you put the expectation here and you encourage them to get to that level, you're actually going to get a lot more out of your child. And I think that principle applies probably in, in, in our own lives, I guess, too. Um, but just something that happened last week while I was sitting here with, with my son Owen in the, in the ministry was that we didn't have an opportunity for him to sit with some of the buddies over here normally. Um, he had to sit with Dad alone. But you know, something just came to my mind that when I was seven years old, uh, my dad ministered, and that's how I came to know the Lord. And we underestimate the value of just having your child sit in the, in the ministry. And um, I put that expectation there. I said, no, my boy, you're going to sit here, because one day you're going to thank me for being here. And I just want to encourage everyone here. Never... Don't put that expectation here for your kids. Um, I think it's part of your ministry, it's part of your calling, and we need to be putting it there. And our expectation must be there for our children so that we can see them come to know the Lord Jesus. Isn't that the most important thing? You know, I would, I can, like Rupert said, we can be the best parents and we can be the best 
husbands and have a wonderful family life. But if we're not achieving those things which are spiritually eternal, then we're really achieving nothing. You know, by the grace of God, I am yesterday, but I'm just so thankful for that because it was a seed sown in my heart. Um, and I think we just need to, and I just want to encourage that with that little message. I just remembered that story of Samuel where he had the two sons, and I think it's in Samuel 2, verse 17, where they're discussing um, Eli's sons. And we all know the story of Eli's sons. And, and this one scripture says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. We don't want that our children. We don't want them to be hating the word of God. But we know the story of Eli, where he had neglected his responsibility as a father, but God had seen, had provided salvation through the life of Samuel. And I remember that, that point in, in, in where I came to know the Lord at a very young age where it was touched on my heart, just like Samuel, there was a call on my heart to say, um, you know, three times there was a call, and there's a call on each of our hearts, and it's, it's up to us to respond and to put on those priestly garments, put on Jesus Christ, and be ministering in that, in that, in that gifting, one to another. Not a boring the word, but sharing that word and that, that ministry. Praise God. Um, I love that example of what Sean spoke about the, the gold channels that God uses to minister to us. Um, and I was just thinking how in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul was having a different time. And he speaks in verse 5, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5, he says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without, we're fighting within, we're fears. Here's a man that wrote most of the New Testament. This is a guy that you would think has everything together. Yet he's saying they were troubled by all sides. And then the very next verse, it says, Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. How beautiful is this that God uses his church to comfort and encourage and to motivate us to go forward. It's like a husband. A husband and husband can't produce anything. A wife and a wife can't produce anything. But put a husband and a wife together and they produce so if we together as a fellowship, as God's church, Jesus Christ's church, work together, encourage one another, um, lift each other up, go to one another and say, this is not right, let's help you here. People come to me and they say to me, look, this is not right, let's build each other up the whole time. If we do those kind of things, God's church is being built up and he uses people. God can. And he will at points come and he works in your heart and he stirs it around and he comforts you when it's needed. But in most times, and it, I think in most times in the Bible that I could see, he uses people to come and do it. If you look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, everywhere is people being used through God's Spirit to minister to others. So when we as a church try and build together with Christ, through Christ, this church, don't stay away and try to do things on your own. It will not work. It's bound to fail. But when we do it together, working together, oh, only beautiful things can happen. So I want to encourage us this morning, don't try and do things on your own. Husband and wife produces fruit, and a church of God, through the headship of Jesus Christ, produces fruit. Amen. Direction. Do you feel the direction? You can anticipate somebody coming to you at some stage or another in the next week and saying, Hey, my brother. Exactly. Maybe just during lunchtime. 
fact, that's what it should be. Hey, good. Something's not like that. Or, hey, I'm so glad that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's a better, a better thing to hear, isn't it? We need to be free with one another. There's an open members of the body of Christ able to admonish one another, able to have input into one without getting upset. Uh, loving one another. Caring for one another. I'm, I'm seeing the fire still flaming there, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to another minute or so. <laughs> Take the opportunity to drive home this reality that we are the body of Christ. And as Peter said, we are working together. We are members one of another. Knit together. Totally dependent upon one another. Never have I needed you more than now. And never have you needed me more than now. Because we are Christ to each other. Especially in this world that we live in. I think we probably live in the most dangerous period of time that this world has known. This is the most dangerous period of time. This is even when God is going to shake the church to see what will fall off. That that which is that that which should remain will remain. So be aware of that. You could be shaken off, brother. Don't get shaken off. Stay in. Commit. Sell all. Now some people read that incorrectly. They start selling all their things. Except they don't sell the things they like. They keep them the ones they like. <laughs> the king. The king has his demands. Sell all and follow. Jesus said it to one of the disciples. He says, follow me. <laughs> you know what he did? He dropped everything and he followed the Lord. That was Matthew. This is a tax collector. What did he eat after that? Well, he freeloaded on all the other believers. <laughs> I like that thought, Peter, very much. Because there are freeloaders. You can only receive and very rarely give. So, I'm sure Matthew went and did what he had to do to stay alive. There's no doubt about it. But from then on, we have to change the world. Later on this afternoon, when before we conclude, we're going to have a time set aside for us to pray and to make our commitments and dedications to the Lord. And you know, the best way to do it is to do it publicly in front of everyone. Um, so that we all are accountable one to another, to the same body, so, and, but we're accountable. And in being accountable, we can remind, hey, what, you remember what you said that day? What's happening? And king name, name your king. Uh, you know, it depends on how root, ruthless you're going to be, but name your king. Your king. He's looking for a queen. <laughs> you put your foot into that one. Not a queen's day today, it's a king's day. 
I think we should pray. Father, you're speaking to us in real clear terms and you've reminded us of the fact that we're golden pots. And true Lord, we're not rusty old pots, but they because they carry the precious word of God. And Lord, we want to deliver the precious cargo into every life that you put us into God. We pray, Lord, that there will be an upsurge amongst us in our commitment to you. That we don't fall foul of falling asleep in the church of Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, that as we have lunch now, that you will bless the food to our bodies, strengthen us for your service.